Proverbs 26, verse 12. And I'll read through verse 16, Proverbs 26, 12 through 16. And you were just up, so I think I'll leave you down. If you just got to stand, you can, but I think I'll leave you down. 26, 16, or, or rather 12. Do you see a man who is wise in his own eyes? There is more hope for a fool than for him. The sluggard says, there is a lion in the road. There is a lion in the streets. As a door turns on its hinges... So does a sluggard on his bed. The sluggard buries his hand in the dish. It wears him out to bring it back to his mouth. The sluggard is wiser in his own eyes than seven men who can answer sensibly. Let's pray. Father, would you take your word and sink it not only into our ears but into our hearts to such an extent that it would shape the way we think and feel and desire and do. Conform us to the image of your dear son by your word and your spirit for his glory and for our good. This we pray in Jesus' name, amen. The, uh, the irony is not lost on me that I am um, preaching a sermon on the sluggard and I'm up here using notes, which I almost never do. <laughs> I don't know if uh, that's because I stand before you as a sluggard who didn't work as hard as I should have this past week. I hope it's not that. Um, these sermons from Proverbs have not been typical for me. So one text on a topic from this book never quite satisfies the topic. So it has us running all around the book to cover our bases. And uh, my little mind wouldn't seem to stay around all these references. So um, I probably needed it two or three weeks ago. I don't remember which service it was, but... I couldn't find a reference, and Lisa called it out for me, sitting in the pew with my notes. So, um, so here we go. Um, I don't like it, but I think the content matters more than me preaching without notes. So, uh, Lord willing, I should be back to more normal approaches soon. Um, I want to tell you a joke. So, I guess notes is unusual. Jokes from me are unusual as well. I like I like this joke. Um, it's a joke about a, a slug. Do you know what the slug said when it was riding on the turtle? It said, Wee! <laughs> <laughs> All right. That's that's pretty good joke, isn't it? And uh, it's all a matter of perspective, isn't it, for the for the slug. Uh, that seems like a, a rapid, torrid pace. Um, I was wondering, when I was preparing this sermon, I was wondering, I wonder where the word sluggard came from. And I, I imagine that they had this animal called a slug, and then they went from the animal to the lazy person. But I found out it was exactly the opposite, this the animal, the slug that moves so slow is named for lazy people. It started with this biblical concept of, of the sluggard. Um, this, is a, this is a problem in our day. I read a little article in Forbes magazine that cited some data from achievers. And uh, they, had, um, they had surveyed workers in the workplace and they asked them if they were highly engaged in their job, and uh, 21% said they were, which means 79% said they weren't. 79% not 
highly engaged. And then Forbes, interested in what it's interested in, went on and talked about uh, the many millions of dollars that a business owner could, could lose by those less than fully engaged laborers costing them millions. I think in a company of 250 workers with average wage and uh, that short of um, uh, diligence, they were saying over $3 million annually. That was just one business. If you multiplied that out across the country, across the world, you'd be into the trillions. I'm quite sure lost because of people not working the way they should. Now, this is in Proverbs all over the place, and one of the reasons I'm going with notes is, is to demonstrate that, and my mind won't stay around all, all the detail, although we won't hit every text and every place. But the fact that it's in here is, by my count, this notion of the sluggard shows up in 13 of the 31 chapters in Proverbs. 13 of 31. First time in chapter 6. Um, last time, maybe the text we've got, 26. Um, and then if you, if you use the, the backhanded way of doing it, not talking about the sluggard, but just promoting the virtue of diligence and labor and hard work, it would be practically in every chapter. Certainly, we began this series from chapter 31 on Mother's Day. It's certainly in chapter 31, isn't it? The virtue of labor by that wise woman. So what do we take from this that it shows up all over the place in Proverbs? I think what we take from it is that God cares about this. This matters to him. And it matters quite a bit. There's a, there's a tendency for us as Christians, as followers of Jesus, to compartmentalize our discipleship and think that what Jesus cares about is my prayer life, and he cares about my Bible reading, and he cares about my church attendance, but the rest is not so important. So my following Jesus shows up in those what I call and fancy spiritual pursuits, but these other things that seem so much secular, that they're, they're not so important. And the main way that I might make my labor spiritual is to evangelize in the workplace. But that's not what Proverbs is talking about here. In fact, Lloyd-Jones says you shouldn't evangelize in the workplace. Can you believe Lloyd-Jones would say that? But he did. Do you know why he said it? Because he said... Your boss didn't hire you to evangelize. <laughs> he hired you to do something, or she hired you to do something, to put your hands or your mind to something that matters, and they're not paying you to evangelize. They're paying you to do work, to do labor, and labor matters to God, and it should matter to us. So let's just look together at this portrait we get of uh, the sluggard in Scripture. First of all, he's, he or she, they're, they're idle, they're not doing very much at all. There's another verse in here where it says, he does not plow in autumn, and then at harvest time, there's nothing to, to reap. He doesn't put his hands to anything. He is idle. He's not giving effort. He's also confined. He's also confined. You may have been a little puzzled by that verse, verse 14, I think it is, as a door turns on its hinges, so does a sluggard on his bed. What in the world does that mean? I mean, you understand turning and tossing on your bed, I expect, but what does it have to do with the door? I, I, I think it's, it's confined, so I could, I could go over there. The camera would lose me, so I won't, but I could go over to that door, and I could swing it open, and I could close it and swing it open and close it. I could do that a 100 times. I could do that a 1,000 times, and the door would still be hinged. A lot of activity, a lot of movement, but it doesn't accomplish anything except opening or closing. It doesn't go anywhere. It's always stuck in the same place. I think that's what's going on here. The, the sluggard is tied to his bed or to his couch or hinged to her remote control or her phone. Nothing is accomplished. And then he's 
or she is distracted. I think if we were going to talk about the modern worker, worker, we could talk about distraction a whole lot. There's one verse in here where it talks about that, that mere talk doesn't accomplish anything, uh, but diligence does. Mere talk doesn't get anything done. Have you ever been distracted by conversations at work? Just, just get stuck in a conversation and uh, the relationships matter. So I'm not saying that should never happen, but you can waste a lot of time in a conversation when you're supposed to be cranking some kind of work out. Uh, a lot of us fancy ourselves multitaskers. I think that's not really a thing at all. I think the truth is it's switch tasking. And, and if your labor, if your labor is thought work, everybody's labor is not, and if you have labor that's really not thought work, it can be a blessing because you can be doing your labor and doing it well and thinking about something important while you're doing it. So that can be a blessing. But if your work is thinking work and you're constantly being pulled out of your thinking to check your phone, to check your email, to do this, to do that, to play a video game, you're never going to get very deep. <laughs> It takes me a while to get to any depth in my thinking. And if I'm constantly being pulled out of it, and then I have to sort of try to get back to that same depth again, I never get anywhere. Depending on your work, that may be an issue with you. Distractions pull us away from diligent labor. In the New Testament, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, the Apostle Paul talks about, he says, I hear that many among you are idle you're not they're not busy at work they're busy bodies I, I think he's saying that they were distracted with other people's issues and other people's lives rather than being diligent about their own work they're thinking about other people all the time and what's going on with them would social media be a distraction in our lives? Absolutely. Could it be a distraction at work even? And would that be us being busy bodies rather than being busy? Maybe not necessarily, but often perhaps? Distracted. And then we ought to talk about the heart of the, of the sluggard. So this inactivity, this thing where things don't get done it doesn't come out of a vacuum does it it comes from somewhere internally we ought to think about that it's really it's, it's really hard for us to get these things right the, the first thing about the sluggard's heart is it's disordered ordered and I would say distorted disordered and distorted things aren't um, things aren't properly prioritized and, and balanced well Look at chapter 13, verse 4. If you turn over there with me, 13, 4. The soul of the sluggard craves and gets nothing, while the soul of the diligent is richly supplied. So the sluggard wants, not that he or she doesn't want anything. It's not that they don't get hungry or they don't want material possessions or maybe even that they don't want to bless somebody near them. They have cravings, but the cravings are never really realized because they have other cravings and they compete against each other. Things get distorted. Back in our text in chapter 26, or rather, I think it's chapter 24, if you look there, you'll get this little phrase that you get often. Verses 33 and 34, a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest. And poverty will come upon you like a robber and want like an armed man. Do you hear the word little there three times in those two phrases? It's giving you the attitude of the slugger. Just a little sleep, just a little slumber. Just a little folding of the hands to rest. Or maybe, I'm told in the Hebrew, it's not just hands but arms. So it's possible this is a, this kind of folding of the arms to rest. 
you're not moving me. I'm staying right here. I'm not doing a thing. Do you hear the heart attitudes beneath those phrases? Just a little more sleep, just a little more slumber, just a little more folding of the hands to rest. The heart is disordered with competing desires and no sense of what God would hold as priority in those. The, the Bible gives you this beautiful balance, doesn't it? It gives you this glorious balance between labor and rest, doesn't it? We have this concept of Sabbath that's introduced really early in Scripture, and it runs all the way through uh, the, the length of it. And th- there's labor that's promoted, six days shall you labor in Exodus chapter 20. But then there's also rest. There's that Sabbath rest. And, and beyond that, you have a verse like the, in the 127th Psalm where it says, In vain you stay up late and rise up early, eating the bread of painful labor, for he gives to, gives to his beloved in their sleep. So you have this rest promoted there and encouraged, saying that it's a good thing. But this heart has gotten so distorted. That rest is taking more and more territory in that heart and more and more space in that life until diligent labor is getting crowded out. There's also fear here. Do you look at verse 13? The sluggard says there's a lion in the road. There is a lion in the streets. There's fear. If I go out there, the lion might eat me, so I think I'll just stay in now, there's a verse in Ecclesiastes that talks about if you kind of watch the weather, maybe you'll never do anything. The, the rain would stop you from, from um, getting out in the field or whatever, and so it might rain, so I think I'll just stay in today, that kind of thing. Farmers have to watch the weather, but you can do it obsessively, and you can do it as a reason not to, not to work. Jim read from Matthew 25. Do you remember what the slothful servant said? I I knew you were a hard man. You you reap where you do not sow, and you gather where you scattered no seed. You remember what he says next when he's giving his defense to the master? So I was afraid. I was afraid. And sometimes fear is at the root of the lazy person. Uh, Sometimes it's fear of failure. Sometimes laziness and perfectionism run really close together because it's got to be, if I'm going to do something, it's got to be perfect. It's just got to be perfect. What's at the root of that kind of perfectionism? There must be some pride there. There's only one who's perfect and you're not him. Uh, I'm not saying it's okay to do shoddy work. I'm just saying, if you wait for perfection, you'll never get anything done. If you're afraid of failing, so you do nothing, because to try hard and fail is a blow to my pride and my ego. That slothful servant was afraid and fear was at the root. What did the master say to him? What did the master call him? You wicked lazy servant laziness is wickedness yeah absolutely absolutely it is according to scripture and that fear of the lion there in verse 13 runs us to excusing just come up with an excuse maybe it's the weather maybe it's a lion in the street now now we know there were lions in 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 the bible days and in uh, the Bible geography, where, 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 the, where the stories of the Bible are located in the Middle East, there were lions there. Uh, can you think of stories in the Bible where people got eaten by lions? Uh, you can maybe, I'm thinking of two. If somebody can come up with a third one, I'd love to hear it. So there's one in Daniel. Daniel doesn't get eaten by the lions, but his opponents do. And then there's one in 1 Kings chapter 13, the prophet who gets lied to by another prophet. God told him not to go back that way, and he went back that way and returned. And a lion mauls him. It doesn't eat him, but it mauls him and just stands by his body there. So there were lions, but 
the Bible covers a lot of geography and a lot of history, and you just have two stories. I, I, I don't really think that's a major threat. Do you? And especially, it sounds like when it says a lion in the streets, uh, it's not like it's in town. I, I doubt the lion, lions came into town a lot. I, I don't think they came into the city a lot. This is, this is a heart desiring to not work, looking for a rationalization. Isn't it? It's exactly what it is. Is it okay to love rest? Yeah, the Bible commends it. It says it's a good thing. Is it okay to not love labor? No. Because the Bible also commends it and says it's a good thing. In fact, in Ecclesiastes, it says repeatedly that you ought to enjoy your toil. And if you can, then God has, has given you a wonderful, a wonderful gift. And then what else would we say about the the sluggard's heart, we'd say that he's prideful. You, you might have thought, I should have just read verses 13, 14, and 15 and left 12 and 16 out. But look how this text is framed. Do you see a man who is wise in his own eyes? There's more hope for a fool than for him. And then if you go to verse 16, the sluggard is wiser in his own eyes than seven men who can answer sensibly. Very much like the schemer that we saw last week. He's He's so proud nobody can say anything to him. Seven sensible men can speak to him about his condition and what he's doing, rather what he's not doing. And he thinks he's way smarter than they are and way wiser than they are. So he's proud. As we said a few moments ago, the, 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 the proud... Uh, perfectionist, maybe also the proud procrastinator and the, and the proud slothful, as well as the proud one who can deflect any rebuke, any word spoken in love of why it's okay for him to be or her to be idle. And then finally, uh, they're blind, just this heart is blind. I think doing this so long, it, it can't see reality very well. It's a short walk from distortion to blindness. Spiritual blindness is a particularly horrible condition. If you're physically blind, you, you know it. You're, you're aware that there are other people in the world, they... Uh, they they have this experience, this sensory experience you don't have. And you also know that the world is not set up for you, but it's set up for the people who can see. And, and you make accommodation for it. But when you're spiritually blind, the, the worst thing about it is you think you see just fine. You think you're seeing clearly. And you keep tripping and falling and breaking bones and running into things and busting your nose and all kinds of stuff happen and you don't understand why. And you're blindly willful and you're willfully blind. Let's look quickly at the consequences. Consequences are painful. Look at chapter 10, verse 26. Like vinegar to the teeth and smoke to the eyes, so is the slugger to those who send him. I can't say that I've ever had straight vinegar to my teeth and I hope to go to my reward never having even have diluted vinegar to my teeth, but um, I asked my wife, who rather likes the substance, and she said it's not a pleasant experience. I have had smoke in my eyes plenty of times, and it's not pleasant either. Rather, it's painful. And the consequences, the fruit of the sluggard's life are painful. Look at 1519, and you get this a little more clearly. The way of a sluggard is like a hedge of thorns, but the path of the upright is a level highway. It's a description of pain, isn't it? You go on the sluggard's way and you'll be into a hedge of thorns. There's going to be all kinds of, all kinds of pain in it. And what you need to know is that the, the pain is, 
is, is not just for you, but it's for others. That earlier verse, that vinegar and smoke is the slugger to those who send him. So they're trying to employ a slugger to accomplish something, and pain is the result of that employment. When you try to work somebody that's a sluggard, it's painful to you. You don't make any profit, any money. Uh, other workers in your business are discouraged because they're having to carry their weight and somebody else's too. It's, it's disheartening to your good laborers and it's job theft from the bad one. It's painful. But there are more pains than this. He looks at harvest time for something to eat, but there's nothing there because he didn't sow anything. The Bible's clear that the sluggard craves and desires and wants, but, but, but the cravings aren't realized because he didn't invest anything. He didn't, he didn't put himself to anything. And so he goes out expecting to get something when he, he didn't invest anything. Bible teaches there's a sowing and reaping in this world. And you'll reap according to your sowing. So there's pain. There's pain for the spouse of this person, isn't there? There's pain for the, the children of this person. 1 Timothy 5, 8, He that careth not for his own is worse than an infidel. Or worse than an unbeliever. Pain. And then, and then poverty. If you look back near our text. Chapter 24. A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest. And poverty will come upon you like a robber. And want like an armed man. Poverty comes. Sometimes you may read the Bible and think that being poor is a, is a good thing, is a blessing. The Bible does talk about uh, good spiritual fruit from the poor often, especially in the Gospel of Luke. You'll see that quite a bit. But it's no virtue to be poor, especially if the poverty is the fruit of, of idleness. And it's no crime to be wealthy. In, in fact, Proverbs is encouraging Thrift and labor and those kinds of things to the glory of God, to the good of your family, to the good of your neighbor, so that you won't be dependent on anybody, but also so that you can help others. Poverty. And then disorder. Uh, look earlier at that text at the end of chapter 24, verse 30. I passed by the field of a sluggard, by the vineyard of a man lacking sense, and behold, it was all overgrown with thorns. The ground was covered with nettles and its stone wall was broken down. Then I saw and considered it. I looked and received instruction. It's disorder. Could you write those verses a little different way? I, I walked by the office of the sluggard and his office was full of paper and stacked books. You couldn't imagine that he could find anything if he needed to because there was no order in the office. I walked, through the, I walked by the bedroom of the sluggard and the clothes were all strewn over the room and the doors were open. There was a bag of Doritos on the bed that was unmade. You get the picture? I walked by the garden of the sluggard and the weeds had taken it over. You could go on anywhere in this, couldn't you? And you could draw a vivid image of the disorder that comes from idleness. God is a God of order. And this is a hard text for me to preach because order has not been my gift. Thanks be to God, I married someone with the gift of order. And I've gotten to where through the years I really enjoy order and appreciate it. I'm not all that good at producing order, but I, uh, I kind of like it now. And I'm better at producing it than I used to be. Because God put me with somebody who's good at that. Disorder. And then look at chapter 18, verse 9.
Whoever is slack in his work is a brother to him who destroys. Really? Laziness is that serious? Laziness actually is destructive? It destroys? And and it, it it really does. It really does. We know from the fall in Genesis, don't we, that our, our labor would have difficulty in it and frustration in it. When Adam fell into sin, then the earth was cursed and it produces thorns and thistles and we, and we get our bread by the sweat of our face or the sweat of our brow, Genesis 3 says. And if we don't push and push ourselves to produce order and take dominion over this world, disorder will come. And it'll come really, really quicker than you think it will. That's why it said poverty would come upon you like a bandit. (laughs) You think everything's okay, I've just been sleeping a little late and not doing much, and then all of a sudden there's all this disorder, the fruit of your idleness, and your life is destroyed from it. And then not just destruction, the consequences of the sluggard's life is death. Look at 21, 25. The desire of the sluggard kills him, for his hands refuse to labor. All day long he craves and craves, but the righteous gives and does not hold back. The desire of the sluggard kills Seriously? Now, when you read in the Old Testament and when you read Proverbs, it tends to hold before you what seem to be temporal rewards and and temporal punishments, or at least bad fruit that comes from living badly. You live your life according to the grain of the universe, the way God designed it, and good tends to happen, not always, but it tends to. And if if you live your life against the grain, then lots of sorrowful things happen. And that's what Solomon is working out for us as he treats the issue of the sluggard in the book of of Proverbs. He tends to hold up their their temporal benefits. You'll you'll produce wealth if you'll be diligent and and thrifty and, and you'll have something for your family and yourself and you'll be able to share with others. You have all of that and if you... And if you let yourself drift into idleness, then there's going to be all this disorder and pain and sorrow and destruction and even death that can kill you. But in the New Testament, the rewards and the punishments are not just temporal, they're eternal. I think they are in the old too, but it's more implied, it's more explicit in the New Testament. What does Paul say in 2 Thessalonians? Keep away from the idle man, is what he says. Keep away from him. I think it's a church discipline reference. You can't keep calling an idle brother a brother for the sake of the gospel because if Jesus lives in him, Jesus was a worker. If Jesus lives in him, then he must work. And if he's not working, you have to call into question, is Jesus in him? And to keep saying Jesus is in him when the evidence, the fruit of the life suggests that Jesus is not in him does harm to the gospel. What happened to the wicked lazy servant at the end of the text Jim read in Matthew 25? Give his talent to the one who has ten and what? Throw him out. Into the darkness, did it say? In that place there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. What's it talking about? Loved ones, that's hell. It's talking about hell. Are you still not convinced? Find Revelation chapter 21. I'm not sure which verse, but this afternoon look it up and see the list of the sins of those thrown into the lake of fire. And look at what the first one is. It's the cowardly, the cowardly We've already seen how fear is at the heart of much of this idleness. All right, let's go to some application and we'll be done. Uh, chapter 6, the first time we have the, 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 the slothful person show up, it uh, says, go to the ant, O sluggard. So that would be application given on the front end in Proverbs, go to the ant. The ant is 
is not very large brained, not even pea brained, is, and yet it does its work, it saves up and stores up for the future. Nobody's telling it, hey, get that, do that, do this, do that. They just, they instinctively know what to do. They are busy, aren't they? They're always after something. I don't know if they kill it, but they drag it home, don't they? And, and they eat. And there's eat. Go to the ant, O oh sluggard. Secondly, I would say eat the elephant. Eat the elephant. Go to the ant. Eat the elephant. And this is really talking about the disorder we were describing a little while ago. But if you've let your life get really, really disorderly and your heart get distorted like that, then I would say if you try to bite this whole thing off, swallow the elephant of your disorder down in one gulp, you're probably going to get discouraged and you'll be right back in the same place. So I would just say, say pick one aspect of your life. If it's your home, pick the garage, get it in order or whatever. If it's your, if it's, maybe it's your office, but start on the desk and get it straight. Do something like that, but go after dominion over this one area. Take one bite of the elephant, deal with that, get it in good order, and then look, at, look around and find something else and go after that. Eat the elephant. Uh, thirdly, I would say reframe your purpose. Reframe your purpose. This idle brother or sister has no passion for their labor. God loves labor, and yet he doesn't love it. There's no passion there. Why? I, I, maybe he doesn't understand the purpose of it. Your whole life is meant to bring glory to the God who made you. You're to reflect something of his character back to him. And when you read the Bible, you see a God who labors. At the very beginning in Scripture, that's what he's doing. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Is creation labor? Absolutely. You, you get ver- barely into chapter 2 when he says God rested from all the work he had been doing. And then you don't get out of chapter 2 till he makes a man, puts him in the garden to work it and take care of it. So right there, chapters 1 and 2, you get God working and you get a man given and he's put in the garden for the purpose of labor and work. It's frustrated by the fall, but that value continues all the way through. You get all the way to the end again. Revelation chapter 21, God says, behold, I am making all things new. John chapter 5, Jesus says, I and my father are always working and they are. Philippians 1, 6, he who began a good work in you will complete it until the day of Christ Jesus. He not only works, but he completes his labor and he wants us to reflect that to him. So we do good work. Loved ones, we must not be among the 79% that are not highly engaged at work. We should shine like stars in the sky because we're of that 21% and we're of the upper echelon of the 21 who are highly engaged at work. It's our passion because it says something about the God we love and know and worship. Glory to God and then good to man. Good to man. You're doing something, aren't you? You're doing something that matters. You're raising wheat. Why does that matter? People need to eat. They need bread. Did you ever think, farmers, did you ever think that your life is the answer of one petition in the model prayer? Did you ever think about that? That all over the world, millions of Christians every day are saying, give us this day our daily bread, and they get bread because of you. Did you ever think about that? It matters. The stuff you do matters. The education of children matters, whether you're homeschooling or public schooling or private schooling. It's important. It's significant. Selling underwear matters. <laughs> Underwear's important. But you might think your, your labor isn't significant, but I promise you it, it actually is. So see the way God gets glory from it and give yourself to it. Glory to God and good to man. It's part of the way we love our neighbors. Our family, sure, but our neighbors because we're producing something that's valuable to them. And then reframe the significance. Reframe the significance. Some ways we've already talked about it, but let me give you another way of doing that. In Colossians, Paul talking to slaves says to them, it is the Lord Christ you are serving. He's, in Ephesians, he says, serve as if it's Jesus you're serving. But in Colossians, he takes it a step further and says, it is the Lord Christ you are serving. When you go to build a house, 
when you go to run the plant, when you go to the assembly line and you do your part on that assembly line, when you pick up the garbage, when you rule the land as president or governor, when you protect the community as a police officer, ultimately it's the Lord Christ you're serving. It's him. You see, you thought your significance was about what you do. And maybe you even thought that what I do as a pastor is really significant and what you do doesn't really matter all that much, that my work is spiritual and yours is secular. No, Proverbs is correcting and all of the Bible corrects all of that. It's all spiritual. It's all done for Jesus. And it all matters. Reframe the significance. And maybe you have a little more passion about it. Maybe instead of thank God it's Friday, it'd be thank God it's Monday. I get to go and do something that matters for the glory of my king. I get to serve Jesus today in this way. The reason your work is significant is not the work you're doing. It's who you're doing it for. That's the most important thing about it. Teach your kids to work. Teach them to work. I know it's, I know it's harder. It's really, it's really harder to teach them to work. It's easier to do it yourself. You can do it faster and you can do it better. And you can. And in the short run, it'll go a lot better if you don't teach them. Just Put a screen in front of them, let them do their thing, and get the task done, right? No, you're doing harm. You're doing harm to them. And the harm of them not learning to work as children can haunt them to midlife and beyond. It can haunt them all the way through their life. If you do not teach them, God loves this, you should teach them to work and teach them to love work. Many of you have done that great. I've been watching you for 25 years. And then disciple with this in mind. What kind of discipleship is it that only talks about prayer and Bible reading and never talks about what happens 40 hours a week or 50 or 60 hours a week? The discipleship never touches the workplace. It only touches the quiet time and the spiritual service in the church. Now, it should touch those things. But following Jesus covers every inch of your life, every inch of it. You know what? The Bible, the Spirit, through the Word of God here, is trying to conform us to the image of the one who worked perfectly in his father's carpenter shop for 30 years before he ever started a public ministry. He got it perfect. And if you're imagining you're a failure in this regard, and maybe many, if not most of us are, I think the sluggard maybe won't know he's a sluggard, and the, and the person working hard probably thinks they're a sluggard. So you probably got that kind of dynamic going on when I try to preach this. But whatever your failure is, Jesus got this perfectly. And his perfect record is yours if you will trust in him. And all your failures, not of commission, but in this sermon, omission, good things that just didn't get done, never got around to doing them, or didn't do them very well, did them slipshod, or didn't do them at all, didn't produce like should have been producing. Jesus paid for all of that on the cross. And there's power in the blood to cleanse you from every stain. And his perfections are yours if you will trust in him. But loved ones, it's not just that. The power of the blood and the resurrection is so strong that it can take a sluggard and change him. It can take a sluggard and turn him into a diligent laborer to the glory of God and to the good of humanity. That could be you. It really could. Your life doesn't have to end the way it's been. It doesn't have to. And so you receive the grace in Jesus to forgive you and cleanse you, but also receive the grace in Jesus to transform you and change you and conform you to the image of the one who never sleeps or slumbers, who always works. Let's pray. Lord, help us. We know we fall short, we fit and we fail and we falter. Cleanse us and forgive us 
and change us into men and women that would honor you with diligent labor to your glory and to the good of our neighbors. Help us with this and help those that aren't in Christ to turn and trust. This we pray in Jesus' name.